I'm Jake Wolfenden with Summit Safety Group and Safety Consulting Now. And over the weekend, I had the great privilege to sit down with Dr. Robin Trotman, an infectious disease specialist and the medical director of Infection Prevention Services and Hospital Epidemiology. In this interview, Dr. Trotman does a tremendous job answering some of the most common questions about the recent coronavirus scare. Though he acknowledges we don't know all of the details just yet, we still have some really solid evidence as of today, March 2nd, 2020, that this virus will continue to be well controlled in the US and that much of the stigma on this virus is simply fear-based. So I highly encourage you to share this video with your employers, your coworkers, and your loved ones because I genuinely believe it will reduce some anxiety on the topic. And when we're able to pull the anxiety out of situations like this, we're able to focus our efforts on taking a more practical approach to protecting ourselves. And quickly, I need to add that this interview is brought to you by Safety Consulting Now, a full-scale online OSHA and safety training platform for businesses that fall under any of the OSHA standards. You can check that out at training.safetyconsultingnow.com and you can sign up for free as well as subscribe to our premium content that is packed full of OSHA required training, video toolbox talks, quizzes, certificates, and many more resources for you and your teams. And with that, I now present to you, Dr. Robin Trotman. So what we think right now is that the coronavirus came from the food markets in the uh, Ubei province in China. So in Wuhan, China, a city of several million people, they have food markets where they have live animals uh, in close proximity where the food's prepared and often viruses can jump species. So we've seen this with multiple other epidemics and pandemics where a virus jumps from uh, one species to another, from an, arm, from an animal to a human, and so that's the thought. Uh, is where the, the origins of this coronavirus. There, there are other examples of species of viruses jumping um, species from, um, uh, even the thought of HIV was maybe a, 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 a monkey-based virus jumping species to human. The virus has to evolve a little bit. The bird flu and the swine flu, those are examples of where people don't have immunity against a, a, a virus that's found in another species. So when it does jump species, we're, our immune system is naive to this virus and so it causes havoc. So that's why when the virus jumps species from maybe an animal to a human, uh, people get more sick than maybe another coronavirus. I mean, we have coronaviruses circulating in, in the winter months that cause respiratory symptoms annually. We test for those in the lab. Our, our current commercial available tests don't test for this particular coronavirus because it is unique. But uh, year to year, we have uh, coronaviruses. I tell people it's kind of like you have a species of dogs and all your dogs are, are uh, poodles and Great Danes and then suddenly you have a lion that jumps ship and, and so your immune system's not ready for this, uh, this shift. So the current thought is the coronavirus is spread by what's called respiratory droplets. So somebody coughs and it usually gives us a radius of about six feet. So the respiratory droplets that come from a sneeze or a cough are thought to travel about six feet. The precautions issued by the CDC are actually for what's called airborne, which means there's currents of airs that throughout a room or a building, a facility that can transmit the virus. We take those precautions in the hospital right now because we don't know everything that we'd like to know about this virus yet. But typically it would be surfaces, contact with surfaces, you touch where the virus is, it might live on the environment up to eight to 10 hours. So you touch it, it's on your hands, we touch our nose and our face all day. Um, and so it can be transmitted directly that way, it can be transmitted directly from person to person. Typically we think at a radius of about six feet. I, I would approach, and the other thing, I would approach this the same way you think of influenza. We use the same precautions in the hospital. And if you extrapolate what we do in the hospital to the community, it's probably transmitted the same way. Uh, indirectly from surfaces to hands, person to person hands to the respiratory tract. So it is transmitted this, virtually the same as the flu based on the information we have today. There are certain things that might cause the virus to be transmitted a little more readily like in the hospital aerosolized, aerosol generating procedures. So somebody has a procedure that generates an aerosol like a, a, a procedure in the lung, it's thought that it might be more transmissible that way. But for general purposes, it's about a six foot radius. Uh, 
there are misconceptions right now, the media, and there is a sense of hysteria, and a lot of what we're doing is based on March 1st evidence, and this is very dynamic, and I think the stigma of this uh, virus having a high mortality rate or lethality, that's probably been overestimated, and the reason for that probably makes sense. We haven't had a, an available test for a long time. The only people when we calculate a, a death rate or a mortality rate are people who are known to have the disease divided by the people who died from the disease. So we're not able to count the people in the community that had mild symptoms, didn't seek medical care. So probably the background number of cases is higher. And so the number of deaths within that background of cases is probably a lower rate than what we is what is originally being uh, reported. That 2% mortality rate is probably an overestimation of the lethality. So I think that as we have more widely available tests, the public are going to start to receive numbers that show the virus hopefully is not as lethal as was first expected. I think that when we see the stock market respond, when we see uh, political division. I mean, these are the kind of things that make people really afraid, and then it's a snowball effect. So I think for now, the hysteria about the personal protective equipment, um, and those are real concerns that people have. But I can say that as of right now in the U.S., we have real-time available public health uh, systems in place to rapidly identify and hopefully isolate those people. So I think what we need to do is we probably need to step back for a little bit. The disease is not endemic. Just as of March 1st, we've had community-acquired disease, which means somebody not linked to one of these hotspots. So uh, up until now, we've had only people returning with disease or contacts with them. And just as of March 1st, we've had our first cases of spontaneous disease within the community. So I think we probably need to reserve our, our uh, uh, alert we need to make preparations. The CDC is suggesting that everybody be prepared, the healthcare systems be prepared. But from it as an individual, we wouldn't recommend that you go out and stockpile masks or that you uh, prepare food and water for a month. Those types of preparations aren't being recommended yet. The thing that we ask for every year in the cough and cold season is the same and is true no matter what the respiratory path pathogen is. So. All of your alcohol-based hand sanitizers are, are key. My family keeps those. As an infectious disease doctor, we have those at hand all the time. If you go into a restaurant, you're gonna to wanna to use a hand sanitizer or wash your hands. So frequent hand washing, keeping, keeping an eye out for sick people is another thing that people can do. You really shouldn't be at work if you have a fever and respiratory symptoms. I mean, that's one of the key things that we emphasize especially during this period. I mean, there might be people with mild disease, and that's the way this coronavirus is gonna present in the vast majority of people. It might be a mild respiratory illness. It may be no symptoms. So fever, you're not working. Fever, respiratory symptoms, you're not working. And so that, those are the biggest ticket items. Your hand hygiene, your cough etiquette as a good public uh, human being existing on the planet, you have good respiratory etiquette. That means hygiene over your cough. You're not coughing, you're cleaning your hands, and having a good respect for your surroundings. So when there is a, an influenza pandemic or an epidemic, you really need a heightened sense of awareness of what's going on around you. The, the effectiveness has twofold, right? Is it the effectiveness of me transmitting disease to somebody else, in which case probably fairly effective. So let's say that I'm sick, I wear a face mask. I don't transmit to somebody else very well. The typical face mask that you would get that's a paper face mask with ear loops, those aren't effective in protecting yourself from other people that are sick after a certain period of time. We know they become saturated and they become more porous and they don't function. They, they entrain air and they don't cover the eyes. So um, they're not highly effective in the general population However, during a period of an epidemic, they would be recommended because you're doing the best you can. 100% effective, no way, that's not even approachable. But in the event of an epidemic, when we have endemic disease in the US, as you've seen in China, I mean, 
the people in, in Asia, in China in particular, are accustomed to these episodic outbreaks and they have respiratory etiquette that we're not accustomed to. They're in much closer proximity. They live a different lifestyle than we live. So respiratory etiquette is, is very different there. But the, the, the masks would be effective for the patient transmitting disease. In the community today, wearing a mask would not be helpful, assuming you have a normal immune system, right? So, I mean, cancer patients with weak immune systems in public, they need to wear a mask. But for the general population, we're not, it's not time for that. The most likely the symptoms that a person is going to realize with the coronavirus is going to be anything from no symptoms. So there are people we know that are asymptomatic, have the disease, can even transmit the disease in the period of being asymptomatic, all the way to any up, upper respiratory symptoms, runny nose, sore throat, cough. Typically it's cough. As it progresses to a worsening disease, it infects the lungs, the bronchial tubes, and you get a bronchitis, you can get a pneumonia. And then most of the people who've died from this disease are known to have baseline lung, structural lung disease or cardiac pulmonary baseline uh, disease. So somebody with severe asthma might get in trouble if they're exposed or if they develop infection from the coronavirus, as opposed to a young healthy person with no immune system. There are going to be one-offs. There's going to be the occasional case that we hear about where somebody dies despite being seemingly healthy. Um, but the vast majority of the people are going to be either asymptomatic or have a mild disease, maybe a cough. It can last for anywhere from four to ten days. And then what we worry about are these people with other medical problems. They get in trouble. They get a viral pneumonia. They're in the hospital. They can get a secondary bacterial pneumonia on top of that. They can develop uh, heart problems. So if they have baseline heart disease, the stress from the lungs exacerbates or makes the heart disease worse. And so when these problems start to stack up, that's where, that's where people get in trouble. And that's where the majority of the deaths have been seen. So the first thing that we ask during the cough and cold season is that if you have symptoms, you call your doctor first. So what we don't want is a massive influx of sick people into the doctor's offices commingling with well people who are there for routine health checks. So the first thing you would do would be call you would announce that you have these symptoms. If you have these baseline medical problems, there's a good chance they'll want to bring you in. If they want to bring you in, we're going to want everybody masked as soon as they enter the healthcare system. So most healthcare systems now are going to have signage that says, if you have fever, cough, respiratory symptoms, put the mask on, clean your hands. Um, if you have baseline medical problems, you're going to want to call, you're going to want to announce, preferably to an urgent care, say, I'm coming, these are my symptoms. If you have shortness of breath, you're going to want to seek medical care. So, so your usual runny nose, sore throat, cough, typically in an in a otherwise healthy person, you don't need to be seen for that. You can call, you'll likely get symptomatic treatment. In the setting right now, we would not even consider coronavirus as of March 1st. We would not consider coronavirus with that constellation of problems, keeping in mind that might change down the road. It, it might get to the point where if the disease is endemic, meaning that's our new common cause of the cold, we're going to say stay at home. And so uh, unless you have those baseline medical problems, you're probably going to call and you may be advised to just stay at home. Well, there's just as of March 1st, the travel bans have been increased. So we did have travel warnings and travel bans to China and then they start listing these countries in orders of prevalence of the disease. So these hotspots, Hong Kong, right now, Iran, uh, those are going to have travel. So people aren't going to be able to freely return back to the U.S. So that's at the highest level of government organization. And then the CDC administers the preparedness for the U.S. along with the Department of Health. And the, the science kind of comes through the CDC. And then the uh, policies are issued through the Department of Health and Human Services and those kind of blend and out of those come guidance, mandates, recommendations to the states and then typically they're administered at the local health department level. So if there's travel bans, the federal government makes those. If there's an outbreak in a city, the investigation is going to be done maybe by the local health department or by the state. And so as of right now, the CDC lends the scientific uh, credibility and the Department of Health lends the sort of the muscle to how to implement.
so uh, across the board, my recommendation <clears throat> needs to be what would I do for my family, right? And so we would avoid unnecessary travel. If it's, if it's elective and it could be postponed, this would be a good time to postpone most travel. Not because you're going to end up in an area with endemic disease, but you're going to be in tight confines with people from all over the globe. That being said, when there is necessary travel, on the CDC, they have an area on their website that has travel-related um, uh, guidance, and it actually has the areas where you're not going to travel. Well, you probably shouldn't travel, and then it has some areas where we're watching these other areas closely. So from the CDC's website, that's the best way to, to look at, at your travel plans. I, I can tell you, if I, I, get, I do a lot of travel counseling for people doing international travel that need healthcare managed, and I tell them all to take a mask, some sort of surgical mask on the airplane, because you don't know who you're going to be sitting next to, and that person could have influenza or just a regular cold virus, and so you don't want to spend potentially four or five hours in this little box with recirculated air with somebody coughing. So your hand hygiene is connected to your bag or your backpack so that you're using it and you're avoiding uh, sick contacts and you're just aware of your surroundings. So I, I do people, I do tell people if you have to travel, you're going to be a plane, take, take a couple masks with you just in the event that you're around somebody that appears sick. So the current status of the preventative measures like a vaccine, uh, this, this is going to be a pretty incredible response when you watch this. We have accelerated processes to get uh, vaccines approved. Um, so we're working on a vaccine, but it'll probably be mid end of the year, probably third, fourth quarter before there's a vaccine that's <coughs> safe, available, and FDA approved. So uh, we can't rely on a vaccine for this particular epidemic. As far as treatments go, there's some experimental trials on old drugs. So right now there's no you know, available drug. They've, they're doing trials in China and other areas looking at old drugs, drug we use for treatment of HIV and some other antiviral medications. So if we do end up with a treatment that's effective six, nine months from now, it's likely going to be reusing a drug that we've already used for maybe Ebola or maybe it's a combination of an HIV drug and an Ebola drug. So, but as of right now, the treatment's basically symptomatic. Yeah, the virus can live on surfaces, probably not for more than half a day. So there's fear of people receiving packages imported from around the world. And so that threat is pretty low and we don't consider that a, consider, a, a recognizable threat. So I wouldn't worry about touching surfaces of things mailed from from China right now. You might say eight to ten hours is how long the virus might be viable and infectious on a surface. So for most of the uh, hand hygiene that you recommend, soap and water is good. You have to make sure you wash both sides of the hand. So one of the when we do hand hygiene observations, one of the things we find is people don't wash the back of your hands. So maybe 30 seconds. If you could scrub your hands dry, that's a, that needs to be a 30 second process. Your alcohol-based hand sanitizers, they're all going to say they have some content with alcohol. We're looking for things like Clorox wipes for your surfaces. Um, if you're in the work environment, that's going to be key is, is bleach and the Clorox wipes. Those are good for a con high contact surfaces.